Okay, so uh, it means maybe two thirds of the people have not heard of bioethics before this meeting. So at least one of the outcomes of your attendance at the workshop should be to be able to explain to people what is bioethics. Some of you are medical technologists and some of you are working in public health areas. Yes? So bioethics, how does it relate to what we do? New technology has been a catalyst for re-examination of medical ethics and social ethics and international dialogue on ethical principles. And we also use terms such as medical ethics, dental ethics, environmental ethics, public health ethics, applied ethics, ethics of biotechnology. If you're a medical technologist, you might have an ethical standard for the operation. You might have heard of a good laboratory practice, yeah, of a good procedures. The basis for these is in a, an ethical principles uh, and we're going to talk about some of them. The foundational ethical principle, in my opinion, uh, is the ethical principle of love and good, beneficence. It supports the development of science and technology that might cure sick persons, or feed hungry people, or somehow help our society. Now you've heard the word benefit and risk, risk-benefit analysis. Well, beneficence is the same origin, but it's a philosophical term. It means to love others, to love doing good, yeah, precisely. Is it better to do good things and bad things? Yeah? Today is a special holy day, isn't it? Yeah? Because uh, Lord Buddha said we should uh, love doing good things. We should build up uh, uh, certainly not work for accumulation of bad karma, but work for good things, yeah? The same principle is found in all religions around the world, whether you're a Christian or a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist or a Shinto or an atheist. Still to do good is better. So beneficence is a universal issue. Some of you take samples and some of you give samples. Is that right? Did anybody uh, provide any samples last week? Give some blood to some doctor? Give some urine for a job interview? So what happens to the samples? And this is a sample yourself. For example, um, I had my hair cut uh, several days ago. Um, it's rather short for me. What happened to the hair that was cut off? Is it precious? Could it be used to identify me? Could it be used to clone me? Could it be used to do voodoo tricks against me? Possibly all these things. So, uh, samples, and when we have biological material, we have a responsibility to other people to look after their sample. So, that's one of the basic issues. So we're not just doing good, we're taking samples to do good. And we're going to hear, hear about that in some presentation uh, by NAFIS this afternoon, in laboratory samples. But we also have a responsibility to do no harm when we use those samples. I used to uh, do research in molecular biology. So my uh, PhD was on, first PhD is on molecular biology. So I lived my life running electrophoresis gels and samples. I uh, used cell lines and freezers full of samples from different patients and different cell lines. So is that uh, we had responsibility. Many hospitals gather samples. And from around the world, it's one of the issues that we've used in uh, colonial research is been trying to, to map people and the ideas. 
Have you ever heard of the genographic program of the National Geographic magazine? I grew up with National Geographic magazines and beautiful pictures. They are supporting a program to map people to their ethnic origins around the world. So which valley you came from in Nepal? Which tribe you came from, from Papua New Guinea? Or from Tanzania? Or from southern India? India recognizes uh, officially over 323 tribal groups, maybe more. So in Nepal, you have a uh, less, but at least there are 20 officially recognized and more. And maybe uh, in the United States, there are 566 federally recognized tribes, and there are other tribes who are not federally recognized. So there's uh, lots of people. So around the world, there are thousands of population groups. We can use the samples to map people's origin. Is that ethical? Are we, going back to our principle of beneficence, doing something for good? So when I'm a medical scientist, I'm trying to find uh, a disease or a prognosis, a way of helping you. But when that sampling becomes just for mapping, to find a cartography, a, a map of where people come from, It's a bit like the butterfly hunter of the past who just wants to pin butterflies onto their wall to make hundreds of collections of butterflies. Maybe in museums, traditional museums, you've seen this. They collect butterflies and insects. And this can even be a school project. Go and catch as many butterflies as you can. It used to be a common school curriculum. Now there's not so many butterflies left because they're all pinned to somebody's wall. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the same for indigenous tribes. Used to collect samples and then try and begrudgingly to uh, exterminate and uh, pin them to the wall. So we have responsibility that if we take samples, if we intervene, it has to be for the ethical principle, beneficence, to do good. So whenever the next time you take a sample from somebody, think, is this to do good? For who? Hopefully for the person giving the sample. Now, if I can help you get better by giving some sample, then I don't mind, but I need to give my consent. Bioethics also looks at the social structures. So the sociology, we have some sociologists here looking at sociology. So what's our description of society? There are social hierarchies, and in Asia it's a structured paternalism, meaning the social cultural history is a paternalistic, it's structured. There are upper classes and lower classes and untouchables and people in between. And when I go to the doctor, uh, usually the patient becomes almost like an untouchable their opinion and their voice has no meaning. And the health professional who went to a university and got a degree is meant to know everything. So leave it all to you. Um, I would like Kako to talk, to exp tell us a Japanese phrase that people use when going to the doctor. Because we often say, I'm like a tuna fish on a chopping block when we go to the doctor. Know this expression? I don't think I did. You don't know? Damn it. What is that in Japanese? So it was a Japanese expression that you were like a, a big tuna fish and going to be cut up on the chopping board. So when you go to a doctor, she's had a very uh, enlightened experience of doctors. That's good. So how do you say it in Japanese? I don't know. <laughs> I'm only a tuna fish. I wasn't going to talk. <laughs> Just to be chopped up. <laughs> so do we have a relationship where people feel like they're just uh, speechless? Do we have a doctor-patient as a similar level? Or do we have a patient above the doctor? 
Okay, so now that you go to the magazine, and uh, quite a few people go to the cosmetic <coughs> clinic. I'm not going to ask you if you've been to the cosmetic clinic. You may have been to the aesthetic saloon or the beauty salon to do your hair, to cut your beard, to put whitening on your teeth. You might have been to the dentist to do orthodontics to make this a perfect smile. If you look at me closely, you'll notice I, I never went there. <laughs> Uh, but nowadays, it's sort of a common <coughs> assumption that people should have a perfect smile, whitened. The placement of our mark on our head, mm -hmm. this is also a beauty statement, yes? <laughs> so these are, but in this case, it's the consumer or patient that's above the provider. We're choosing from a range of things. We go to a clothes shop in the market and we buy clothes. You are not, nobody here is living in a country where you have to choose a clothes provided by uh, somebody in power. However, when you went to school, you probably had to wear a school uniform. Many countries still use a school uniform, even a university uniform, which is a bit like the paternalistic system. So, can we change these relationships? Well, in all societies, there's a transition um, from paternalism to informed consent to informed choice. I'm very pleased that nobody is using their telephone right now. They have the telephone in front of them, many of you, but you're not actually using it because it must be either no signal or <laughs> Uh, I'm entertaining you. But this is a, a path. And so our latest application in our iPhone is in monitoring our health, our heartbeat, our blood pressure, telling us when we should even urinate, time to go to the toilet. Okay. Uh, but you can't go during the lecture, so we just to block that signal. Um, so these are a transition. But is that informed, and informed by whom? Is it informed by marketers who say everyone needs to have a telephone of a certain make? Even if you don't earn enough money to put proper nutritious food on your table, you have to have a telephone. It has to be this make. So our public health priorities are neglected. So, some of this comes from a talk, an editorial I wrote in the American Journal of um, Bioethics in September last year. We can and must rebuild the bridges of interdisciplinary bioethics. And why did I say that? It's because I believe bioethics is holistic. Although we can argue that bioethics is holistic and found in every culture, and still alive among people of many indigenous communities, as well as in the postmodern ones, postmodern communities. The academic discipline of bioethics, as interpreted by many scholars, has attempted to burn bridges to both different views as well as persons with different life tra trajectories and life training. The bridges between different cultures and epistemological foundations of bioethics have also been strained by this uh, dominance of Western paradigms of principalism and the emergence of academic profession of medical bioethics. What does the uh, paradigm of principalism mean? It means, what's a principle? Okay, so principle means like, I protect autonomy, or I promote beneficence, I don't cause harm, I promote justice. And this is a, certain principles which we will promote. In your codes of practice, you might have things such as confidentiality is a principle. Veracity, truthfulness is a principle. Uh, 
you may be meticulous. If you're a laboratory scientist, you should be meticulous. Is that a principle? Or is that just a method of doing it, which is based on principles not to make mistakes, which could cause harm? Okay, so we have different um, usage of primary and secondary principles. Okay, so we also have people from different backgrounds, and in the self-introductions, we've seen that some of the people here, including the AUSN faculty here, and the uh, participants, um, have different backgrounds. But they're working together, um, hopefully. I want to take you to a, um, a skyscraper. The skyscraper was built, uh, this is called Casa Grande. It's in the Hill River Indian community in Arizona. It's a three-story building dating hundreds of years ago to mark solar and lunar solstices. Now, the solar solstice, do you know what it is? No? Every year, the sun goes up and down, the earth moves. So if I'm a farmer, I need to know when to plant my crops. And what happens if the crops fail? You starve. You die. Lunar solstice is every 18 years. You need a fairly good knowledge of astronomy to know the lunar solstice. But this building marks the lunar solstice. Okay. There is a uh, uh, hole that the sun, the moon, can be sighted through once every 18 years. Why is it important? The movement of the moon is actually related to the movement of water tables. And so you may know that we have droughts sometimes. But if you're sophisticated, you may know that the droughts go in cycles. And the cycles are linked to the moon. So this reasonable foundation for our origin of religions to be very thankful to the sun and the moon. These were objects which we could experience and they're very important for our survival. So in this sort of a development, you can see traditional cultures had a knowledge which is very important. Uh, and the knowledge is really important because people die if you uh, have a drought, in the desert especially. Uh, in Nepal, you don't have a drought very often. Yep. But in the plains, um, you will. And you still have, you may have floods, okay? but these may not be predictable by the solstice. I think, say, bioethics is pre-human, and I'd urge you to go beyond the usual boundaries of time and space, to look through history and globally and understand bioethics as the love of life, uh, can be argued to be pre-human and thus as old or even older than cultures themselves. We let organisms have a physical space, a home, a work, and relationships are critical for our survival. So, Any of you got a pet? Anybody got a pet? It is. Yep. So, do you know which animal is most recognized as most able to follow visual clues of communication from human beings? Cat. Yeah. Dogs. Yeah. Cat. Cat and dog people. Okay, who's a cat person? Put your hand up. A cat person? Dog person. So, it's interesting in scientific research in terms of communication cues, domestic dogs are probably the best at reading communication signals from human beings. Because they've been working, evolving for hundreds of years together to understand. 
and then select it. And so if you point, the dog can point, they know and they can put faces and other things. Because that's the that's the role. Scientifically shown. It doesn't mean that we're most clever. Okay. But it means that we're most able to communicate to us. So quite interesting. They've developed this into kind of a path of evolution together as we selected them. Um, What's the animal on my tie? Whale. How many whales do we find in Nepal? Do we find any whales at all in Nepal? No. I hope not, because there'd be poor whales stuck in the landlocked lake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Whales are clever. Okay. But their, their communication works in different ways. South African whales have a communicator the witness to communicate to Australian whales okay. by using uh, thermal planes in the ocean. They can communicate five or six thousand kilometers between south of South Africa and south of Australia. We wonder what they're talking about, <laughs> but it's interesting whether they're making comments just on the whale gossip or they get involved in human gossip or uh, avoiding the uh, whalers. <laughs> but this communication is interesting. So they can communicate with themselves. So sophisticated animals we know communicate. They have principles. We have uh, interesting things in our study of uh, biology, which is, uh, that's also bioethics, and some people study animals. Uh, why do elephants remember the tasks of their family members? Why do they pass elephants from task to task? So if you were an elephant, could you two professors please stand up and imagine your elephants? Oh. <laughs> Asian elephant and an African elephant. <laughs> They have just come to the graveyard of their dear beloved mother uh, and the large bones are there. And they've migrated and they come back next year. He will pick it up in his hand. The bone. The bone. And he will pass it to... You. You. So the task, the remains of their dear mother, not very respectfully put down, <laughs> are passed from, from trunk to trunk. Very interesting behavior in African elephants. I'm not sure if it's an Asian elephant, but you enjoyed the game. Thank you. It's very interesting because human beings have strange rituals as well. In Japan, in the funeral ceremony, the only time we pass things from chopstick to chopstick is what? How come? What is it? Bones. The only time you will take uh, from your chopstick to my chopstick, some item is a bone to put on the urn of the cremation. Yeah? So when you're, fortunately your mom and dad is still alive, but when they pass away, you will have to pick up the cremated bone and pass to our family member and put on the urn. So this is a very interesting uh, ritual similar to the African elephants. Because in some other cultures, they just pass from chopstick to chopstick. So I always tell people, yeah, that uh, when you're eating in a restaurant, you never pass food from chopstick to chopstick. The only thing you do is this with bones at the cremation of your uh, friends or family. And for elephants too. So some people don't like to do this. I've been at funerals where <coughs> some people do not want to pick the bones of and the chopsticks. So we have all sorts of rituals. In some countries, they embalm the body. Now in Hindu culture, and I've seen in Kathmandu, the riverside where you burn bodies, yeah? I don't know if it's, it's one of my first trips to Kathmandu I saw this, and I've seen it in India as well. Um, fortunately, I didn't know the people. Um, but this is sort of an interesting 
uh, rituals. Chimpanzees have funeral rituals. So we have this behavior, we have the ethical principles to discuss. A right to a house owning property. If you've studied any animals before, you'll know that territorial constraints are a rather important thing of not only human beings. Do we have a right to own a house? Yeah, it's actually meant to be a fundamental right. Well, Now, this, uh, we've talked about American University of Sovereign Nations, the idea of different knowledge systems, as you heard in the introduction. In your laboratory tests, are you only using Western medicine, or are you using traditional knowledge as well? There are traditional tests that we can use to test. And if you look at old medical texts, such as the uh, Hippocratic Corpus, uh, ancient Indian texts, you'll find different indications that are used for people being sick. So traditional medicine is used by the majority of people. Around 80% of the people in the world use traditional medicine. It's often cheaper than Western medicine. It's associated with holistic approaches to health, social, spiritual, and physical. It may include exercise and prayer. But the knowledge of this is being lost because of the dominance of the pharmaceutical industry. Market-driven healthcare systems, loss of culture, loss of land, loss of identity. We can be used as an evidence-based medicine, balancing risks and benefits of all forms of harm, like anything. Harvesting and growing and preserving the environment. Now, does anybody know where this house is? It's in Pretoria, in the settlement in Pretoria. And uh, it's one of the standard settlement houses, black settlements. But all of them were painted in one color, but suddenly there was a house painted like this. This is where the traditional healer was living. He's an ophthalmologist practicing ophthalmology in disease of the eye. He's had students from the Americas, from India, from China to his place, and he has traveled to these places around the world looking at different traditional medicines. And um, you can, if you talk in the talk tomorrow from Professor Kaya and Shimrachi, you'll see lots of um, examples of indigenous knowledge. In his clinic, he does use a mixture of modern and traditional diagnostic tests and treatments. Okay. So he's using both, integrating. Bioethics is also about other beings. So I think it's a mistake to compartmentalize public health, environmental ethics, and bioethics, and medical ethics. The academic term bioethic was first coined uh, in 1927 by Fritz Jahr. And a paper was called uh, The Bioethical Responsibilities of Human Beings to Plants and Animals. He was a Protestant pastor in Germany. And so it sounds like he should have been a Buddhist priest. Yeah? the bioethical responsibilities of human beings to plants and animals. Because we, our association with uh, European culture was very human-centered, anthropocentric. But bioethics is about all types of life. And we see other people in the Western tradition, Odo Leopold in the sand country Ormanac, and Valerie Zapata in Bioethics of Rich the Future argued for the inclusion of other beings into bioethics. But in the United States, Almost all bioethics scholars and departments focus on medical ethics. But uh, we do not. We focus on both medical <coughs> and environment and uh, social aspects and anthropological aspects. But all are, to me, related. So bioethics is a bridge. We break boundaries across the table between people. 
and across countries. That's what we're trying to do. Now, you had not heard of bioethics, but there is a United Nations declaration called the Universal Declaration of Bioethics Human Rights. And all your governments have agreed to it. That clearly, since in the declaration it says, bioethics education is compulsory to all levels of education and should be promoted in the public, that most people have still not heard of bioethics. So the government is not always doing a perfect job. That means you can't rely, you have to work yourself. So what does the Bioethics Declaration say? Well, it mentions a number of principles which were agreed to be universal. At least a description, we can find these in each country. Possibly as a prescription to establish laws to protect people so that this paternalistic divide is reduced. Human dignity and human rights, consent, privacy, many issues here. So in bioethics, what we try to do is reflect on these principles of how they might a practice. So let's say your association wants to establish new guidelines to protect its uh, clients and patients as well as the uh, professionals. We might apply these principles to the case. And that would be a bioethical approach. So the graduates or alumni of AUSN, of a bioethics program, are expected to be able to apply bioethics principles to moral dilemmas that they have. Can they do that, Ramesh? Yes? Yes. Good. Give them some exercises later. So no dilemma is too complex for bioethics. So, um, bioethics and environmental ethics. The term bioethics is often replaced by the uh, former term medical ethics. We can't simply blame, blame the bioethicists for this, however. Okay. We have a, a need to think about bioethics in a broader context. Good morning, sir. So I think it may be a good opportunity for us to do a formal opening ceremony uh, and we will resume our PowerPoint later while you reflect. And I'd like to welcome a dear friend. So um, let us uh, uh, just pause this for a moment. Ask to Thank you, Renan. Okay, so we were talking about bioethics and environmental ethics. Do you think how we will do? Thank you very much, uh, uh, Honourable Member of Parliament and a dear colleague. And the candle is lit. And um, we have a enhancement of our bodies through paint. So we were talking about what is the meaning of bioethics and the dilemmas between bioethics and environmental ethics and public health ethics. So more important than the name is uh, the ideology behind the name. So if bioethics is the love of life, how do we have a develop a comprehensive understanding that our individuality is a social construct? So we are individuals, we use different principles to make moral decisions. Uh, clearly this is an example in a social phenomena of sharing um, paint. <laughs> uh, the social construction of a, a method for promoting harmony and also uh, reflecting on the importance of the day. Bioethics and public health systems. So all public health issues are bioethics issues. Bioethics is not just about my individual responsibilities. 
but also about the system. In fact, as the uh, Minister mentioned, the policy that can be developed to save lives, the policy to clean up the environment, the policy for education, the policy for installing values of our culture into people is critical as well. And how do we build bridges between these different aspects of our culture? Okay. So also I mentioned here uh, the need for bioethics to have a systems approach. It's not just something that I can say, well, I believe in this thing and I believe in bioethics or I go to the church on Sunday or I go to the mosque on Friday. It is a systematic approach to reconstruction of our values underlying our decisions. If our foundation is beneficence, if our foundation is non-maleficence, it affects all the things that we do. And the systems we construct, whether it be an ecosystem or a social system, we are not isolated individuals. Um, and maybe listening to this for our device, we have a human beings, we have uh, chimeras, we have uh, artificial intelligence systems who like bioethics, they will also read. Some of you read a newspaper. Yeah. I don't know if any of you still read newspaper or use social media to look at news. You may know that more than half the stories we read are written by AI systems. It's not human beings writing stories. Most of these news stories, even in this uh, fabrication of fake news, AI systems are programmed to create. Uh, is it worthwhile to read newspapers anymore? I'm not sure. Because you're actually reading constructed stories. What's the role of uh, how would we approach it from ethics? Well, we have uh, principles of veracity, of truthfulness. We also think about what is the meaning of the knowledge sharing. But we have a lot of challenges that are going to occur in the, uh, as we develop our systems. We may talk about bioethics in uh, saying it's very modern, but there are ancient things. And I want to give an example of charitable water wells. Uh, in a paper um, that was interesting looking at interviews of farmers in the Nile Delta. So some of you ask, what sort of research should I do for bioethics? And the answer is do something that's relevant for social change or for developing the system. So this is an interview of farmers in the Nile Delta. Charitable water wells or fountains solve a widely established nature. They provide both um, drinking and irrigation water. They have charity oriented norms. What does that mean is that this is free water. So water that you can take and use for your farm or for drinking. Uh, many projects developing water. So charity is a concept we find in all major religions and it's also a lifesaver for many vulnerable people. Just as much today as it is in the past. In the past, if you visited the person's home, they may welcome you with some food, tea, paint, <laughs> all these uh, uh, welcoming signs. But as we go to privatize things, uh, we've lost this ethic or the spirit of justice. So, the title of that paper, The Moral Economy of Water, is an illustration. Water is essential for our life. Some of us are drinking it, but we're drinking from bottles. Probably somebody had to buy this water. In the past, uh, and we used to drink from springs. So it's an illustration. Fish. I saw fish in Kathmandu yesterday, but this, this is a landlocked country. And of course, there are river and lake fish, but sea fish. What has happened in the oceans of the world is because people think it's a free for everybody. If you develop a big ship, you can make a line that's 60 kilometers long behind your line to fish and catch all the fish. And the countries and nations who have the money can harvest the fish and almost every fish 
is being depleted. So we have some fish are going extinct. How do we develop sustainable food choices and agricultural practices? So this is an example. We need uh, to also think about that. Water depletion is another example. In much of uh, uh, China, for example, the water level is really going down. We're using groundwater. And the groundwater in many countries is just depleted lower and lower. I believe that our two colleagues from South Africa, they live in Durban where you have a bit more rain, but on the other side of the country in Cape Town, uh, it's uh, globally interesting. The water tap is going to be turned off. It's the first major city to have the taps turn off, meaning uh, no water will come because there's no water left. Unless a miracle happens and the rain occurs earlier than uh, it normally does. So we have ethical principles here, such as equity, uh, vicinity, frugality, transaction, multiple beneficial use of water, mandatory application of quantity and quality measures, compensation user pays, polluter pays, participation, equitable and reasonable utilization. So this is a scarce resource. We can apply the same to other scarce resources. So in managing the environment, we have principles we can use. Uh, when we had a low population, uh, we could often eat as much as we wanted. We could cut down as much as we wanted. Many indigenous tribes, we think, live sustainably with nature. There's an interesting study uh, in my home country, Aotearoa, New Zealand. We had uh, big birds called the moa, M-O-A. These were the biggest birds we know, somewhere five meters high. Five meters high is a bird we could probably pat it on the neck out the window here. Five meter bird. When they looked at the pits, the ovens of the people had cooked the moa, they found about one third of the meat was not eaten, it was wasted. So these birds were so plentiful, people just hunted so easily, and they wasted the food. The moa became extinct, all 13 species are extinct. But uh, that's what human beings unfortunately do. If something is too easy, they will make it extinct. So, this ethic of preservation is important. So that's a, an environmental issue. How do we apply historical evidence in contemporary discourse? Not least of which is changing patterns of historical analysis that writers often use to selectively quote examples that support their present day arguments. So especially for AUSN, we're looking at traditional knowledge and culture. Often people have rosy views of um, traditional knowledge. We have an expression uh, which means I'm looking at the world through rose-colored glasses and actually I am <laughs> because I have paint on my glasses. But <laughs> rose-colored glasses means we look at the world, it's all a rose. Like yesterday we saw in the garden, the rose. Yeah, uh, Everything's pretty. But we have to think of the methodology of the understanding of history if we're going to apply it. Especially when we're looking at philosophical discourse between uh, different religions. And this is a picture of an earth god. Earth god is common in many parts of the world. So earlier today I talked about the sun and the moon. Clearly they give us a lot of things and it's obvious why we would pray to the rising sun or pray to the sun god. Okay. Earth also gives us everything. So probably in Nepal you have earth gods. This is a Chinese earth god. And many, almost every house in uh, Taiwan will have an earth god on its uh, family altar to pray thanks for the earth. Okay, so we have to give thanks for all these elements and what we receive. There's also stories, for example, uh, were Eastern religions closer to nature? Well, 
Buddhist land management. We need to look at archaeology, not just at the literature or the mythology that comes and see whether it was or not. Um, there was a study of uh, Shinto animistic beliefs. So in Japan, uh, animistic religion is a traditional, it's called Shinto. And you'd think that being closer to nature would mean for more preservation of nature. And often in modern, postmodern Western society, they've said, Eastern religion is better for us. We need to go back to this. But if we look at the history of Japan, the forests were converted to agricultural lands and industrial estates and roads. And if you travel around Japan, basically all the flat land is converted to houses or industrial area. So, and if we look at the last couple hundred years history, there was no greater preservation of nature in Japan, despite its animistic relief, belief, than in Western Europe. And the reason that environmental pollution was limited in the 1960s and 70s, the limit was not because of fears of uh, the holy uh, forests, it was because people started dying from pollution, such as the amount of disease and other things. So it was an anthropocentric, human-centered concern. That drives most environmental laws in the world. So we have a theory and we have a culture and a religion, but these are not always being applied to actually uh, help people. Um, an interesting exception for this, I think, is sacred groves in uh, South Asia. In India, there are many sacred groves. I think in Nepal, also sacred groves where you find a temple site, which is a biodiversity reservoir. And people will even die rather than touch the reserve. And I don't know if you have this expression in, uh, I've learned from our friends from the south of India, Tamil Nadu, the old saying, a mango tree is equal to 10 human lives. So you would never cut down the old tree by people. So people can die, but you must leave these big trees and preserves because uh, to be protected. So that's an uh, a example of a Hindu belief system that is um, preserving nature. Bioethics also deals in other issues of health. This is an example of eugenics. Eugenics is the self-direction of human evolution. This is a picture from the Eugenics Record Office in 1931. Eugenics is integrating all fields of knowledge, whether it be genetics, sociology, religion, statistics, geology, anthropology, all together. So this was a popular belief, an ideology that all universities were teaching, that uh, we need to direct evolution through social programs of eugenic evolution. There's another topic we talk in, in ethics. Uh, Islamic science, the uh, famous doctor and philosopher Abyssinia, uh was very important. And when we talk about religions and fundamentalism, we need to remember that a thousand years ago, Europe was in the Dark Ages. And what we call science and technology was introduced back to world culture through the Islamic science. So Europe had the Dark Ages and Islamic science rediscovered and was actively involved in philosophy and science. And nowadays when we talk at any fundamentalism, whether it be Christian fundamentalism, Islamic fundamentalism, Hindu fundamentalism, all of these fundamentalisms are, have problems in the lack of integrated approaches. We need all forms of knowledge and respecting knowledge. So bioethics principles, coming back to this, we might, in Asian societies, place more value on harmony, or love, virtue ethics, relationships. We have alternative views, feminist approaches, um, relational ethics. These are challenges to this simple principalism. Why is this so? Well, 
if you look at the history of colonialism, and there are, uh, as far as I know, three countries in the world which were not colonized in the last uh, 300 years by the Euro major wave of European colonization. Can you tell me the three countries that were not colonized? Nepal, Thailand, Thailand, Nepal, and Japan. So these uh, three countries. <coughs> The Poles, great job. <laughs> Thailand, interesting. I think Thailand's the most interesting case because Nepal is surrounded by mountains. Japan's surrounded by the sea. Both have fierce warriors. But Thailand's interesting because they're in the middle of fertile land. And they, their approach was, we give the French some land, we give the English some land, and just uh, leave us be. We give you more land. We don't want more to fight. We trade. And so that's an interesting approach, but they're obviously strong enough to resist the colonization because of other countries are colonized. But ideologically, colonization still may have occurred okay, in all these places. But uh, universalism and environmental values, do we, now, if we look at international treaties, and there are hundreds of United Nations treaties. I used to work for the United Nations. And uh, my job was to try to get countries to implement treaties and declarations. <coughs> Almost all UN staff has their job. But the, the interesting thing is, if the treaty was actually good enough, people would implement it themselves. <laughs> the problem is, all these pieces of paper, uh, they are uh, espousing good things that we all share that we need to make things relevant so people will actually change their life. And that's why hopefully these things will do. Now, Justin Fry is uh, one of our AUSM professors and their friend of um, Al Hassan as well. Uh, he's a fellow Tanzanian. And we looked at the human rights, equity, common but differentiated responsibilities, vulnerability, precaution, sustainable development, participation, peace, Respect for nature, shared responsibility, and the value of biodiversity for its own sake. All of these principles are in international law on the environment. So there are principles. Each country that's saying Nepal is developing a stable government can try to see how these <coughs> principles and national laws, which may be good on paper, how they can actually be used to protect people, to protect the environment. Now that it's stable. How can we do it internationally? So this is another challenge of bioethics. Three principles from uh, a Chumash tribe, indigen an indigenous culture. Chumash uh, territory is uh, where the current city of Los Angeles is located. It's a Chumash land. And their three basic laws were limitation, moderation, and compensation. So there are three principles. They're different to the principles we may learn from the Europeans. Okay. But they're still, I think, quite good principles yeah. and reasonable. Uh, so health and colonization had disastrous effects. Uh, the health of people has suffered. Fortunately, we have many associations such as public health and also philosophy, anthropology, bioethics, working to promote indigenous values and cultures and apply these to deal with these challenges. How do we make people live uh, with a higher quality and a longer life? We see problems of diabetes. Diabetes is a problem in Nepal. It's a problem in India, it's a problem in Bangladesh, it's a problem in Native American culture, it's a problem in every country in the world. Ironically, where we still have people dying of hunger, we have people who have too much food and too much sugar and uh, diabetes. So how can we try and fix this holistic approach? That's one of the issues. This is a, a picture of a prickly pear cactus. 
Um, last week, I stopped on the road in the Apache Nation and was talking to a lady I'd not met before. She had a lot of kids, she was a grandmother. And uh, I started talking to her that this year I found the prickly pear was almost bearing no fruit. And uh, she also started, then started talking to me about prickly pear and saying, yes, she'd been trying to teach her grandkids to harvest the prickly pear and this year was particularly bad. Because 2016 was so much fruit that almost nobody gathers it. There are a few people who are trying to gather. It's a delicious fruit. Um, it, this knowledge is lost, so people don't eat enough fruit or vegetable. It's growing cactuses everywhere, but uh, they go to the supermarket and buy junk food and uh, sit down in front of TV and watch junk media, uh, and that's their life. They could go out and prick prickly pear and uh, enjoy it. So that's an example of indigenous knowledge and health the whole system. But it's not only their fault, because they were indoctrinated with a different system of what is healthy food or trendy food. Uh, interdependence is a principle of bioethics. Interdependent means we're all dependent on each other. So we have a doctoral program in bioethics, sustainability, and global public health. All these things are interdependent, and we try and teach people about all sorts of different subjects. Finally, uh, I want to share a couple of thoughts on disaster ethics. Disaster ethics, very timely. We have an ambulance going to some disaster, hopefully not a big one, but still important for some people. You had a major disaster here. Thousands of people died in the country. These are also catalysts for us to think about what we establish. Why do we let people build buildings that are substandard? Why do we not listen to traditional knowledge of where to build, of how to build? We have engineering ethics, medical ethics, risk analysis. How do we deliver? Um, Fukushima is an example of the world's most expensive disaster it's in Japan. It was because of uh, human error and a nuclear power station uh, that didn't have proper protection. In the same area, I can find traditional knowledge. And uh, this is a tsunami warning stone intended to be open data. There's about 300 of these stones known and documented in Japan at the moment. And they usually say, a big wave came, many people died, so do not build below the stone. It's a traditional public health message. But what do people do? About 20 years later, after the earthquake, you'll find in the flat land by the ocean, houses and farms and people living there again, below the stones. And then in some part of this, uh, countryside in northeastern Japan maybe every 60 to 80 years there will be a large tsunami a 15 meter tsunami uh, if we're I don't know if you know how high we are from the ground but I would calculate we're about my feet are about 10 meters above the uh, ground outside maybe 15 so we might be okay we could go one story higher and pray it would be okay so we have these uh, coming. It's we know earthquakes will come to Nepal. Yeah, it's certain. We don't know which day and which year, but it will come again. Do you let people build the house on the fault zone? It's a family traditional land. Do you force them to go away from it? Can they live there? How do they live there? So these are dilemmas for us in terms of informed choice and disaster planning. There are some dangerous places and we try as a government, for example, not to let people build in very dangerous places. But 
if it's not enough land. And poor people always live in disaster zones, in the, by the rivers which will flood. Yeah, they're always living there because the land is cheap. It's the only place they can get. Yeah, do we let them live there? So these are the questions of ethics. Human security has these terms, instead of principles, they talk about freedom from fear, freedom from want, freedom to live in dignity, freedom from hazard impacts. So these are conceptual pillars of human security. So we can use a different language, human security. Do we have these freedoms? I hope so. Research policy linkage. How do we develop this research into policy? We need to link the two, and that's so bioethics is not just about the beautiful values of lighting a candle. It's a, a lovely expression of life. The bioethics is in how do you take that principle that's expressed in the spirit and apply it to policy. If you do value life, then value it with policy. Yeah. Um, and if this is more important than short-term capitalism or money, then value it. That's the principle. So we have this, uh, you know, we study research and policy. Another example, since we just heard the sound of another ambulance, where do, how long should a person wait between their telephone call and the ambulance coming. How long should they wait? In some countries, they set the national policy to be five minutes. In some countries, they set it for 10 minutes. In some countries, they have no such policy. But if you were to establish respect for life, you would establish an ambulance station in a certain geographical distribution so that people could be reached <coughs> and their life could be saved. So it's very important, uh, whatever view you have, be it anthropocentric, biocentric, or ecocentric, um, we need to reflect on these views and uh, reflect, reflect on our principles and apply those to practice. The Human Rights Conventions uh, have a lot of text. For me, the most important convention uh, principle article in both the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights and the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is this. All peoples have a right to self-determination. By virtue of that right, they freely determine their political status and freely pursue their economic, social and cultural development. So this is the principle of bioethics. It is, you have self-determination as a person, as a community, as a nation, to freely decide how your value will influence your development. How, how much are you going to balance all these different things and needs? So that's what we're trying to do. Um, thank you very much for listening. And uh, I welcome any questions that you have or discussion uh, before we go for lunch. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> yes, please. Any comments or questions? No, no. I think this is great. Enough. Enough questions? Any comments or questions, anyone? Okay. Professor. Yes. Please. So, first of all, thank you so much for your. A very nice and a very succinct presentation. It's quite good to know about the. For me, it's a little bit different area of uh, study because I'm from uh, peace and conflict state, but much more part you have already incorporated. So when it comes to ethics, it's a quite philosophical one, and the uh, people, as you presented in your presentation, they think about it's just to you know like uh, praying and uh, and uh, doing some kind of worshiping and uh, not acting uh, by themselves. But my question is quite, I mean, uh, I'm quite up, uh, close to your argument that we have a such uh, certain 
responsibility certain activities to protect our environment our shell and uh, of course uh, the responsibility goes uh, according to the position status uh, let me let me make you clear a little bit uh, clearly what do you think about the responsibility you know played by the the countries they have been producing a larger scale of carbon uh, carbon carbon and uh, of course the countries they are they are highly and massively industrialized and they they are uh, degrading the other kind of environmental and the we are suffering from them uh, the most of the uh, you know like developed country like UBC, Japan and China and even in Russia so they are they are they are uh, you know like degrading the environment and but unfortunately doing nothing to our part that we are suffering from their contribution so how you cope up and uh, how can you relate these bioethics and uh, this kind of the sovereign nation's responsibility towards environmental protection. Thank you very much for your question. Um, firstly, yeah, so although self-determination is critical, uh, the problem is that when individuals or countries abuse the system, they will take more than their share of the resources, more than a share of their fish, of the water, <coughs> of the carbon, of fossil fuel. Some of this was done in ignorance because they didn't know the consequences of global warming. But at least for the last 50 years, they've known the consequences of global warming. Uh, and so, we, for those, we need to have principles such as pollute the pays. If you use it or pollute it, then you pay. Can you... And then you have, in terms of pollution, uh, now, Nepal, fortunately, uh, is downstream for air, but upstream for water. Okay. There's no country really sending its dirty water to you. You're sending water, clean water, to the rest of the world. Okay. But the air goes around and the climate does change, glaciers melt and so on. Hopefully the countries will accept their ethical responsibility for the harms that they caused and share in this global fund. And that was the general agreement. That it may be difficult to force this on country. So we can, in our life, what we can control is ourselves. So we change ourselves and hopefully through this beacon of change uh, other countries can see. And unfortunately even in development still in your country you still have the problems of uh, development. So hopefully we can go directly to clean development. Um, but yes, yeah, so we all share responsibility but in the end we have to take our responsibility and. Unfortunately, we can't just point the finger and say they did so badly to us, it's their fault. Uh, because they're still going to do it. But maybe for seeing the change that we're doing, they can then change themselves as well and understand that there's a different path of development. Other questions or comments? I mean, first of all, I wanted to add something to what you said about the countries which are not colonized. I mean, we have also Liberia and Ethiopia, they were also not colonized. So it's in addition to what you said. Yeah. But uh, there's also another thing is when you talk to issues of policy. Because there's also a tendency in the issues of love for life, what you call yourself. I think there's also a time whereby communities and peoples and individuals should also take their own responsibility. When, for instance, you find in South Africa and other parts of the developing countries, people live in an area where there's sewage, they live in the houses, they're updated, but there are a lot of storms which they can take their own responsibility to improve their own lives. Thank you. Yeah. So we have to take a responsibility. 
Any other reflections on the ethics or values? I think we have uh, had a hopefully interesting morning.